All right. Genesis chapter 1, very familiar passage. Now, I want to start off tonight because, you know, at this church, we believe the Bible literally. We believe what it says. And I don't care about what science that's falsely so-called says about the Bible. We're war actually warned about that in the Bible. That, um, and if you want to keep your finger here, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Obviously, we're going to be coming right back to this. But I just want to lay the groundwork because Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the earth. Genesis 1 explains how God created everything. That God is the one that formed and fashioned and that made the earth and all the animals and all the trees and all the plants and everything that we see today, God created it. And he tells us how he did that. Now, there's a lot of people out there that hate God. There's a lot of people there that don't believe in God. They don't believe he's real. But they have a problem because they have to answer a question, where did we come from? If God doesn't exist, if there is no creator, where, where did we come from? How did we get here? I mean, it's, a, it's foolish to think, well, we've always been here. Everything ages. There's time. The, the earth ages. It's, you know, there, there is a starting and a finishing. Everything is like that. Where does life originate? And they can't answer that question. They have no answer for that question. They think they have answers, but they're foolishness. They're, they're, they're stupidity is what they are. They're not real answers. And what they do is they'll use the name of science as their God, as the source of all truth. They'll say, they'll use that name, science. Now look, I love science. I think science is great. But what they do is they take something that's not science and they call it science. Science is something that you can observe and test and repeat. You, you, you learn about our surroundings, about nature, about these other things by being able to conduct tests and studies and, and observing and, and knowing what the variables are and, and all these different things. You can, you can do tests and repeat it. That is science. That's real science. And I love that. I think it's great. I mean, we're, we're at a point today technologically because of you know, the learning and science and this wisdom that we've gained over the years, okay? There's nothing wrong with that at all. But what I have a problem with is when people start coming up with these theories and imaginations and calling that science and just saying, like, that is true. And what they do, what they want to do is say, science trumps God. And they say, well, this is science. So this is hard truth and evidence and... You know, the Bible is just a bunch of fables. And that's what people will say. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, because we're warned not to be deceived by this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 20. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So there are people out there were people out there back in Paul's day, okay, that are professing in the name of science that's falsely so called. It, it shouldn't be called science, but it is. And they're overthrowing the faith of some people. They're oppositions. They're in opposition to God's word and they're claiming it's in the name of science. And he says they've heard concerning the faith. They're they, they're they're mistaken. They're wrong. And they're still wrong today. People, the unbelievers have been doing this because if you don't want to believe in God, you have that answer of origin. How do you, you know, where did we come from? Genesis answers that question. God answers that question for us. He knows that we want to know these things and he's given us the answer. And um, I just wanted to show you that. Flip back to Genesis chapter 1 because people will mock the Bible. And this is one of the reasons why they mock it because of Genesis chapter 1. They'll say, oh, you think, you think God created everything in six days? You, you think there were just six days? Yes, I believe that there were six days. Six literal days. Now, first of all, God doesn't write things in His Word to confuse us or to confound us. So, if the earth is millions and billions of years old and we really evolved, you know, then, I mean, if, if that were true, 
then yeah, this then I would reject this whole book if that were true, because that's in complete opposition of what this says. But it's not true. It's wrong. And and what what Christians like to do or they try to do is they say, oh well, this is science, so it you know the Earth must be billions of years old. But how, but I believe the Bible too. So how do I make these fit? And they made the mistake right off the bat of assuming that this falsely so-called science is true. That's where they made the mistake. And then what they do, instead of questioning the science and saying, well, maybe that science is wrong, they start questioning God's word. And they say, well, how can I make this fit? And that's where we come up with these various bizarre doctrines of the gap theory, the day-age theory, this theistic evolution theories that are out there. None of them are true. You cannot make the two merge. You cannot make the Big Bang and evolution fit with, the, with what is written in this word. I'm going to get into the details of that. Now, my first point, because this gap theory was stupidity for so long, but it's gained a lot of attention because it's found in the Schofield Reference Bible. And if you've if you've never heard of it before, like I didn't grow up with this with, with this in even in a Baptist church. Okay, this is this so some of these things are new to me, but I know that the Schofield Reference Bible has been used widely by many churches, and it's full of false doctrine, starting in the very first page. Now I don't own one, so the information that I have I received off of the internet. So forgive me if it's incorrect. Because I don't, I'll, I'll end up getting a um, a physical copy for myself. But I've seen it written in the text. So if this isn't verbatim, it still teaches this. Okay, and you can look it up for yourself. But I'm pretty sure I went to a site that has these Bible studies online, and the stuff is is all is all printed there. But I mean. I really don't care if it's not verbatim because it teaches the same exact thing. And I'll tell you right now, this is the reason why I do not ever recommend buying or using a study reference Bible. I don't recommend it at all. Because for one, what they do, especially when they, they put it in like with the Bible. So you're in the mode of reading the Bible and you got man's word mixed in with God's word and they're going to be teaching you whatever. Now, Especially when you don't know that person, you don't even know if that person is saved. If you got an unsaved person, Schofield was not saved. Okay, he was he was not saved. He he does not have the truth in him. Just based on the the amount of false doctrine that has come that he's written, and it's I mean it's 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 gross. It's it's grossly false doctrine. It's not just like a little bit here and there. Like even what I'm talking about today, it's not just this. There's way more that that he preached and believed. That is, um, that's just way out there. But you don't know if the person's saved or not, so why would you ever want to be getting your doctrine from someone who's not saved, first of all? You don't want to do that. So you, reading Bible books, reading the commentaries, reading this stuff, be very, just, just keep that in mind. You know, I'm, I try to steer clear of all that stuff because I don't want my mind to be corrupted by some false doctrines of someone else. We don't need that to understand the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, people argue, say, oh, well, how's that different from preaching? Well, for one, how that's different is that the Bible talks about preaching and talks about a preacher and talks about having church. It doesn't ever mention that we should learn by reading other books that men read. It, right, that's, it's not mentioned in the Bible. I'm not saying it's wrong because it's not mentioned. I'm just saying it's not there as far as the way that God has ordained for us to learn his word. Now, he has his word for us to read directly, and he's given us the Holy Spirit, and he's ordained preaching. These are all different things that, that the Bible talks specifically about as ways for us to learn. But, you know, the book, ring. I would just be very, 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 very cautious about it. And this is the reason why. So let's get into this a little bit, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll read for you what this says. Now, you start reading Genesis 1. Look at verse number 1. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Not very difficult to understand. It just very basically starts off saying that God created the heaven and the earth, and it was dark. There was darkness. Okay. And verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. 
Is there anything to indicate to you that some huge amount of time all of a sudden has passed and that an entire civilization has come and gone within this time? No. <laughs> I mean, if you're just going to read God's word, is that, would that be the first thing that pops in your mind? Is just like, wow, there must be something, you know, like, no. <laughs> this is what's known as a gap theory. They believe there's a gap between verses 2 and 3 that God's not telling us about. And within this gap, there was the dinosaurs. There was an entire other civilization. Satan fell. There's all, like, just insane. Okay? But this is what they believe. So, after verse 2, there's these notes. Okay? And, I'm, and there's scriptural reference for this. So what they do, what they're doing, I'll tell you right now, what they're doing is they're taking scriptural references, in some cases that are referring to end times events, and saying that this already happened here. And I'll be quite honest with you, I don't quite even understand the point they're trying to make with some of these verses. But I'm going to read them to you. Some of them I can see how they're trying to spin it or, or, or apply it in a certain way. But some of them I don't even know why they have it in here as support. But I'll tell you why. I think. I think it's because most people are very lazy. Most people will read a reference Bible. Most people will look at those notes and they will not look up one reference. Because there's so much content in there. I mean, you, you could read, it's, a, it's an entire book's worth of, of material just in these study notes. So what they do is, I mean, if you were to actually look that up, you'd have to be looking up. He gives one, two, three, four, five references to look up, and we're only at verse number two. Okay, within this reference Bible, he gives five references, and then and he gives this, this paragraph of what, of, what it, of what it means, what it really means. And most people are not going to go to all of these references and look them up. I will. <laughs> I will just tonight for this one sermon to point out why it's so important not just to get caught up into reading these things. And if you ever do, read, uh, read the references and read them in context. Like his first reference is Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 27. Don't just read verses 23 to 27. At least read the whole chapter. Because you need to know what is the chapter even talking about when you're going to start applying it to other things? Because these false prophets, what they're very good at is taking one verse here, one verse there, one verse there, conjuring up a false doctrine saying, see, this is what the Bible says. But when you read it in context, you're like, that has nothing to do with what that chapter is talking about. You just like the, the phrase that it says, so you're using it to prop up a false doctrine. So without further ado, here's what, they, here's what he says. He says, Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27, Isaiah 24, 1, and Isaiah 45, 18 clearly indicate, no, note those words, clearly indicate. So he's speaking with authority. Look, these verses clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as the result of divine judgment. The face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of such a catastrophe. They are not wanting imitations which connect it with a previous testing and fall of angels. Now, <laughs> there's so much wrong with this. I don't know where to begin. And I really don't want to spend the entire sermon just on this, on this point because you easily can refuting it. He says they clearly indicate, and turn if you would while I'm going over this to Jeremiah chapter 4. And we're with Jeremiah 4 and then Isaiah. Isaiah 24. But he, you know, he, he's using support of, well, the face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of a catastrophe. Yeah, because there was a worldwide flood. There's your catastrophe. But no, they're going to say, no, no, no. This catastrophe, these marks are from something that happened even before the flood. Which is stupid. The Bible talks about worldwide flood. Okay. Which is why we have all these marks of catastrophe and the erosion and the fossils and everything else that exists are totally and sufficiently explained by the flood, by an event that's actually recorded in the Bible, not one that's just made up in somebody's head that, oh, between verses 2 and 3, there is an entire other world practically that existed. 
But the reason why this came up is because some people who claim to believe the Bible don't know how to deal with fossils because they don't understand them. Because they hear things of people saying, oh, well, science tells us that these are billions of years old. But they don't even comprehend how they are telling you that they're billions of years old. Okay, I have a mind for this kind of stuff. I bought into this garbage for the first 20 years of my life. But guess what? After I got saved, after I believed the Bible, is the, is the first time I started actually thinking critically. You can't take what some you know, nerd in a lab coat tells you and just assume, well, they must, they're a genius. They just know what they're talking about. Because if they don't believe in God, they're a fool. The fool that said in his heart, there is no God. I don't care how many letters you attach after their name. I don't care how many decades they spent going to a school. If they don't believe in God, they're a fool. And their understanding is darkened. Okay, they don't know anything. And if they're going to be telling you, oh, no, this was billions and millions of years old, I understand the way the carbon-14 dating works. You know how it works? A lot of assumptions. They assume that at creation, that when things started, there was a certain level of carbon to begin with. That's the first assumption you have to make. Then they have to assume that the rate of decay is constant throughout all those years, all those billions of years or millions of years, that the rate of decay has been constant, that there hasn't been outside forces that would affect the rate of decay. They have to assume lots of different things, okay, which is impossible to know. And then they use circular reasoning of saying, well, it has to be this old because it's buried at this level and the carbon dating. And then they'll say, well, this level means this because of the carbon dating. Like they, they start using two factors to prove each other. Without either, and they both rely on each other, if, if that makes sense. But I don't want to get too much into that either. You want to learn more about like the science behind the creation of the earth and, and the science that, the real science that disproves and refutes these claims of the evolutionists, check out Kent Hovind because he has great seminars and great series. Do I agree with every single thing he says? No, but he has a lot of good factual information that will refute what these so-called scientists will tell you is absolute truth about evolution and because they're not. And when you start thinking critically about these things, you'll start to see, and when you just understand the jargon that they use and just look into a little bit and see, oh, that's what that means. Oh, this is what, it, you know, You'll start to see through the facade. You'll see through the deception of, of what they're telling you of what they believe is a fact, which is a fiction. And it's really just their religion. Um, so anyways, with, Christian, with this gap theory, you know, people who are ignorant of these things and just assume that that must be true, they have to reconcile and they say, well... What, these fossils are millions of years old and we get, and science says that that's how old they are, so what, we have a problem here. And they come up with all kinds of bizarre false doctrines instead of just believing God's word for what it says because it is the truth. Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the word. God's word is truth. God's not a liar. He didn't lie to us either in Genesis chapter 1. And in order for evolution to be true, he would have had to have lied to us. And he didn't. So you're in Jeremiah chapter 4. This is their first proof of, of the, what clear... Uh, you tell me, okay, you, you tell me if this clearly indicates that the earth had undergone, under, undergone a cataclysmic change as, real, as, as it's already happened in the past. Jeremiah 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 23. I, I did read it in context, but I think it's fair enough to, for us to read it um, with the verses that they're referencing. Verse 23 says... I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void in the heavens, and they had no light. Now, you see something like that? Sure, that's very interesting, and I'm going to start looking at a correlation between the two right off the bat. When you start seeing phrases and words that, especially when they're only used maybe once or twice in the Bible, you start, there's a, there's a good reason why it's like that. Okay? And I won't, I won't deny that there's a good reason for that. But the conclusion that they draw is ridiculous. Okay, and I'm not going to get into all of the meaning behind Jeremiah 4 tonight either. I just want you to see what they're referencing as a clear indication that, that there was a gap of years between verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 1. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void in the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. 
and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. That's what they're referencing. So this is talking about destruction from God, right? Lord, the Lord's making a, an end. He said, you know, the cities are, are, um, were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. But this is a vision that, that Jeremiah is, see, you know, is seeing. I beheld the earth. I beheld this stuff. Now, I don't believe he's talking about the creation when he says, I, when I beheld the earth and it was without form and void and the heavens and they had no light. I beheld the mountains and though they trembled. I believe this is, he's beholding the day of the Lord. Okay, when the, when the sun and the moon shall not give her light and there's great earthquake and the mountains are removed out of their places because we see about that in many places throughout Scripture. But nothing would clearly indicate that this all happened between verses 2 and 3 in Genesis 1. Can we be in agreement on that? That this is not just some clear context that just says, oh yeah, of course, this happened. And when you read the whole chapter, nowhere does it say this, this is something that happened in the past. Of um, as far as you know, Genesis 1. Let's turn to Isaiah 24 because there's another reference that they give. Isaiah 24, verse number 1. And that's all they give you in this one Isaiah 24, 1. Isaiah 24, 1 says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Oh yeah, that's real clear that there was an entire civilization before Adam and Eve. <laughs> but let's keep reading it though, because this one in context actually clearly indicates it's not talking about some history. It says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. So you like how they only reference verse 1, but in verse 3 it tells you the land shall be utterly emptied. This is a future event, and they're using it to prop up a doctrine that says this happened already in the past. And if you just read two more verses after the one they reference, you can see that. This is talking about something in the future. So Isaiah 24.1, I mean, you can't use that. And then Isaiah 45, verse 18 says this. It says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Then this one, I, it boggles my mind. How does that support their claim at all? It just simply says that God created the earth so that it could be inhabited. That's it. That's what the verse is saying. He said, Thus saith the Lord, the God that created heaven, he says, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He didn't create it for nothing. He created it to be inhabited. How does that tell us that there was this great, how does this clearly indicate, right? Because those are the words he used. Clearly indicates that there was this cataclysmic event that happened as you know, God's judgment and that these angels had fallen and all this other stuff. Not at all. Isaiah 14 is another reference he gives. As long as we're in Isaiah, let's say in Isaiah, he goes Isaiah 14, 9 through 14. I'm going to go 8 through 15 to give a little bit more context. It says, Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no fellers come up against us. 
Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave in the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And um, this reference is used, of course, this is talking about Satan. It's talking about Lucifer being cast down to hell. Again, where is the clear indication that this has anything to do between verses 2 and 3 of Genesis? It's ridiculous. All it's saying is a future event. Again, another future event that's talking about Lucifer being cast down to hell. Because guess what? I've got news for you. He's not there now. He is the God of this world. He is the deceiver and he is the accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. He goes around accusing Christians to God. That's what he does. And that's what he's still doing today. He is not bound in hell. That won't happen until Christ returns and he, and he casts him into the lake of fire. And then um, he's going to the bottomless pit, and then he's going to be loosed for a season before going back um, into hell. And that's all this is talking about. Again, read these things in context. You'll see this has no support for what they're claiming. They're just writing verses down at this point. And then I'm not even going to get into this just for sake of time. They reference Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. And you know, well, okay, well, let's read it real quickly. Real quickly. I've got it right in front of me. You don't have to turn there. Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 12, the Bible reads, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Again, I believe this is talking about Satan. I think it's very clear. He's referring to the Garden of Eden. It's you know, written to the, to the king of Tyrus, but obviously we're getting a deeper meaning here about Satan himself. I won't dispute that, of course. I, I believe that. Verse number 14 says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Again, talking about the future. The future from when this was written in Ezekiel 28. Not referring to the past. So, that's what they say clearly indicates. And if you don't look up these verses and you just read, oh, you know, these verses clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as a result of the divine judgment. The face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of such a catastrophe. There are not wanting imitations which connect it with a previous testing and fall of angels. It reads great. It reads like a novel, right? It reads like a science fiction book. Sounds exciting. 
Sounds interesting. Only problem, it's not true. It's a lie. And you're mixing in these lies with your Bible when you read these, these study Bibles. And these Baptist churches, they, they're all proud of them. And they lift up, who's got their Schofield Reference Bible today? And they'll tell you what page number to turn to because they're all the same. No, we ought not to be reading this garbage from a man who's a heretic that's not even saved. Let's see what else it says in, John, in verse number 3. So that was just verse number 2, mind you. That, those were the notes at verse number 2. Verse number 3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, in the, the reference... Never reference Bible says, neither here nor in verses 14 through 18 in an original is, is an original creative act implied. So what he's saying is that when God said in verse 3, let there be light and there was light, he's saying, well, that's not really a, the creative act of actually creating it. Okay, when does that happen? <laughs> and he says, also in verses 14 through 18, that's not when it happens either. He says a different word is used. Now, he doesn't tell you what the word is or anything, any more meaning, but he says a different word is used. And I assume he's talking about the Hebrew, but he just says a different word is used. The sense is made to appear or made visible. The sun and moon were created in the beginning. He goes in quotes, in the beginning. The light of course, came from the sun, but the vapor diffused the light. Later, the sun appeared in an unclouded sky. That's what it says. And he says, of course, of course, the light that was created came from the sun. Of course. Where else would it come from? Oh, I don't know, maybe from God or maybe from Jesus, the light of the world. I don't know. Or, you know, maybe it was like it's going to be in the future. Like Revelation 21 says, Revelation 21, 23 says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Amen. The new heaven and the new earth is not going to have a sun. We're going to have the Son, the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, to light up the holy city. There won't be a physical sun. But here they're saying, again, in their fleshly mind, well, of course, where else does light come from? I don't know. How about this light bulb right here? There's a source of light that's not the sun, you idiot. As if God can't create light and himself be the source. I mean, where did the earth come from? He made it out of thin air. It didn't come from anything. It came from God. Where did the sun come from? It came from God. Light came from God. God's not bound to have to have a source for light when he's the source of everything. But this is the foolishness that you find, and they just use these words like, of course, of course it came from the sun, even though the Bible says specifically that in verse 14, look down in Genesis 1.14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. God created light earlier in that week. It wasn't until the fourth day that God had even created the sun and the moon. Light existed prior to the fourth day. But on the fourth day, he created the sun and the moon. He tells us exactly why. It gives us the, the seasons. We can record our time by the sun and the moon. It gives us light in the day by the sun, light at night by the, by the moon. And um, these things weren't created till the fourth day. Yet this liar says that, well, yeah, they were created before the fourth day. But he says that's just when they were made visible because the vapor vanished. 
They're just making stuff up. Be careful what you read. This is garbage. This is nonsense. And it should not be, be read by any Christian because it's just going to trick you or deceive you. And, and you know what? Maybe you won't be tricked by something like this. But maybe there's something else that doesn't sound so ridiculous. Or maybe when you're reading it, you're not thinking about all these things that I'm mentioning and it doesn't sound so ridiculous to you and you get, and you get caught up and deceived by, you know, you're carried about, uh, tossed to and fro with every um, wind of doctrine by the slight of men, by cunning craftiness, by these liars in wait to deceive. Like C.I. Schofield. It's false, my friends. And, you know, this whole... Um, when the Bible says, gives us this creation story, it doesn't say by accident and the evening and the morning were the third day, fourth day, fifth day. It's being very explicit that these are 24-hour days. When you have an evening and a morning, anyone can recognize that he's talking about a literal day. We have further evidence to support this within Scripture, Exodus 20, which gives us the Ten Commandments. In reference to the Sabbath day, verse number 10, or in verse number 8, we'll start reading Exodus 20, verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For, and this is the reason why. He says, okay, I'm explaining the Sabbath to you. You've got six days to work. Do all the work that you need to do in six days, Sunday through Friday. You can work all of those days. But not on the Sabbath day. The seventh day. So that's a day of rest. I don't want you. I don't want your animals. I don't want your servants. I don't want anyone doing work. So nobody's allowed to do work. But why is that, God? Oh, he tells us in verse number 11. For, which means because. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and held it. Because God made the heavens and the earth and everything that in them is in six days. He worked for six days. He created everything in six days. And the seventh day he rested. And that day that he rested, he blessed that day. So that day continues to be blessed that seventh day after he made it. And he's saying, you need to observe this because the Lord has blessed it and he wants you to rest. And what people will like to do is say, well, when it says day, it doesn't really mean a day. It really just means a long period of time. Well, okay, it says the evening and the morning were the first day, and I don't know how you count time, but typically when there's an evening and a morning, there's not that much time going by. It's about, you know, 12 hours between the evening and the morning. You know, a full 24 hours, he's doing work, and then, okay, it's, it's evening time, now it's morning. It's written in here for our, not to confuse us so that we understand what he's saying. It is, it is a regular day. But what people will do is they'll use this verse. They'll use, um, they'll, they'll basically, they'll take 2 Peter 3.8 out of context. 2 Peter 3.8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So they'll still take that and say, See, with God... If he says a day, that could just be a thousand years. Now, first of all, that's not what that verse is talking about. It's not saying that when God says a day, he means a thousand years. That we could just start changing the word day to a thousand years within the Bible or whatever amount of time that we want it to be. You can't just take that type of a liberty. Because in context, here's what that verse says. In verse 7, it says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What he's saying there is that this world is going to be judged. God is going to destroy this world. And don't think that it's not going to happen because so much time has passed. People today in 2014 can't say, well, pfft, I mean, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus came. He ain't coming back. If he was coming back, he would have done it a long time ago. I mean, it's already 2,000 years. It's a long time. He's saying, no, 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 no. Don't be deceived by what you think is a long time because that's not a long time for God. God is outside of time. He's saying, you know, it's 2,000 years later. Yeah, but for God... It's like it's yesterday. Not a big deal because God is outside of time. This is all that's teaching. It's not saying, oh, well, when the Bible says a day, when God says a day, that he really just means it's a thousand years and you start doing this extra math. You're completely ripping the, the context out of these verses and trying to use it for your, to, to support your own false doctrine. And when you read them in context, it's clear what it's talking about. But they still have a problem. These people that do the day-age theory, it still doesn't line up with evolution. Because you have things, let's just say, let's just say, okay, yes, these aren't really 24-hour days, but they're, they're thousands of years or millions of years or billions of years. I don't care. Take your pick. Well, that still means there was no sun until day four. Now it just means, and actually you have even more of a problem if you want to do that. Because guess what he made at day three? God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that was good. And the evening morning was the third day. Um... Anyone who knows real science knows that, that leaves and green trees use photosynthesis to get their energy from the sun, and that's how they're supported. Well, the sun's not created until the fourth day. Now, if it's a 24-hour day and God created something on the third day that needs something created on the fourth day to live, it's not going to die in a day, right? I mean, it'll, it'll still be there. If it's in the dark for a day, it's not going to kill it. God just made it. And even if you, if you want to say, okay, yeah, but, but God said that there was still light. And you're right. He didn't need to have the sun for that. Say, okay, they got their sustenance that way. Well, let's move on then. Because on the fifth day, the Bible says, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters bring for, brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Evolution's going to teach you that, you know, we started off in the water, and then after all this time, we crawled out of the water, and then started sprouting legs, but then there's still some in the water. But then we got on land, and then got on land for a while, and then after being on land, you know, these, these creatures grew wings, and then they got into the air, and then, you know, that's the progression. But apparently... Creatures with wings weren't at the top because then there's still the, the man on the ground, which maybe one day will grow wings and be able to fly around and just get more evolved. I don't know. Um, but this poses a great problem if on this same day, God's creating whales and birds at the same time. He's not saying, okay, here's the whales. Here's the land animals. Here's the birds. He says, no, here's the fish and the birds. And then, another day later, here's the land animals. So you're going to tell me that in this course of this day, however long they want to make that day to be, the next day then comes the... Because there's, there's a separate distinction here. There's a clear distinction of the days of when God created things. So it turns out to be extremely stupid when you try to compromise on God's word and say it means something else when, it's, when it doesn't mean that at all, to try to, to mix it in with that which is of the world and that which is not of God. The Bible is of God. 
the science falsely so-called is of the world. You don't need to worry about what those people are going to say about you and call you ignorant. Look, I've been called ignorant I don't know how many times. I've been called ignorant by people who don't even know what that word means. <laughs> I've been called ignorant by people who, because it, you know, ignorant just means you don't have a certain knowledge. Yeah. Right? That's all it means. So, um, it's exactly right. It's not stupid. It's not the same thing as being stupid. You could know about something and still be stupid. Ignorant just means you don't have a certain knowledge of something. So I'm trying to think of a, of a good example of what I don't have knowledge of. Um, I don't know how, um, how to work on an airplane engine. I don't know what all the dials are. I'm ignorant of that. If you were to sit me in a cockpit of an airplane, I'm ignorant of what all of the devices do. Okay? But I can be told and taught that and, and then not be ignorant of that. People will claim all the time, you know, oh, you're ignorant. You're ignorant of the Bible. Well, no, actually, I have read the entire Bible many times. I'm not ignorant of what it says. You may not like the way what it says, or you might not like what I believe about it, but I'm not ignorant. Two different things. But most of the people who use the word don't even understand the meaning of the word, which I find ironic. But, um... <laughs> But don't worry about it. Don't worry about people calling you ignorant. Because, oh, you're so ignorant. No, actually, I've been taught the entire theory of evolution in the Big Bang. I'm not ignorant of it. I just think it's foolishness written by fools and come up in the imagination of the hearts of people that hate God and that have rejected the truth. I'm not ignorant of it. It's just a stupid theory. Yes, and that is stupid. It's not true. So we've covered that. Those are, those, are some, um, those are some reasons. Look, don't compromise on the Bible. I'm running out of time. There's a few more points I want to get to on this chapter. We're not going to read through this whole chapter verse by verse. But there are some very interesting things that I want to point out. And God made creation in such a way that you have to be a fool to, to think that it wasn't created. In, in the way that God designed everything. And we're talking about you know, things being dependent on other things. So the, the creatures that move upon the ground and all this other stuff. Again, if, these, if the herbs, the, the trees, and the flowers, and the plants, and the grass, if all this stuff was created before the birds were created, before the bees were created, before the insects were created that help to pollinate and help to sustain the life of these plants, then obviously you can't have thousands of years apart or else all of the vegetation would die off because there is this symbiotic relationship that God has created in our ecosystem where all of these various things work together. From the oxygen in the air, from the birds, you know, again, all the insects, the, the plants, everything. I mean, we have, we have apple trees in our front yard. We found out, and because I, I, there's something that I was very ignorant of, fruit yielding trees. Okay, I picked tons of oranges over the past few years, but I was ignorant of just cultivating and, and growing this stuff, and I'm learning a lot more about it. But we found out that we can't just have one apple tree. We have to have at least two, because there needs to be cross-pollination in order to produce fruit. So that was something I was ignorant of. But it's all the more amazing, the way God designed it. They're all reliant on each other. So if evolution's true and things are just becoming better for, the, for their own sake so that they don't die off, why do they have such an impact on other things that have nothing to do with them? Why is it that way? Why is the only way that trees can reproduce is by having the insects come and cross-pollinate? Because that tree out there, if I only left one up there and it never got cross-pollinated, it's never going to produce fruit. And guess what? The fruit is what creates more trees because the seed for the next tree is found in that fruit. It's going to be found within that apple. And that's what the Bible says right here when God created everything. It says in verse number 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. I Meaning it's not going to change in anything else. It's after his kind. Whose seed is in itself. God created things with the seeds in themselves. So here you have the problem, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Chickens come from eggs. Well, the eggs come from the chickens. Well, the chickens come from the eggs. The eggs come from the chickens. Without God, it's impossible to have a starting point. Where did the first tree come from? Well, 
The seed comes from the fruit. Where did the fruit come from? Well, the fruit grows from the tree. Well, where did that tree come from? Well, it came from the seed. Well, this, where did the seed come from? See what I'm saying? I mean, this is... God had to start this stuff. It had to start somewhere. Now, when God created everything, do you think he started with just the seed? No. He started with full trees. They were all ready, ready to bloom and ready to blossom and ready to produce. Just like when he created Adam. When he created Adam, did he create an infant that needed to, to suck on the breast of his mother in order to live and to survive and have someone protect him to, to grow up? No, he created him a full-grown man. I, who knows what the literal age was. But this is another thing I want to point out. We were talking about this the other day. Is that these fools will look at the earth and say, Well, see, the earth is millions of years old. Even if that's true, but which it's not, if you were to say these tests will show us that the earth is that old, the earth looks that old. How old did Adam look on day one? He was one day old. How old did he look? How old would his appearance be if you were to see Adam the day he was created? I don't know, 20, 30, 40, I, I, I don't know. A man? A man ready to take a wife? Yet he was only one day old? The trees that God created that were able to produce fruit for Adam to eat off of. They would have looked like they were probably a couple decades old because they were producing all this fruit for him to sustain himself. But they were just created a couple days earlier. A few days old. This entire earth that God created, it may look like it's been around for millions of years. But guess what? It hasn't. When God created this whole earth, it was created to look a certain age, just like Adam was, just like the trees were. They're mature. It's a mature earth that was created. It's a mature man that was created. They're mature trees and fruit and everything else that was created on day one. Amen. And why Christians can't get this through their heads and just get turned around on science falsely so-called is beyond me. Just have faith in God. He's got all... And now, does anything I just said just make no sense? Like, would you just say, like, well, that's just crazy. That is just beyond the scope of reason that you're just nuts, that you're just believing in a fairy tale. I don't think so. Maybe I'm a lunatic. Maybe I'm just nuts. But it all makes perfect sense to me. And hopefully it makes sense to you, too. Because I don't have a shadow of a doubt in my mind that everything I just said makes perfect sense with, with how things are here and were created by God. So that is one or two more points. Let's, uh, let's jump down. I'm going to get to the end of this chapter now, verse 26. I'm going to deal with just a couple of things here that people tend to have problems with. Verse number 26 of, of chapter 1 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, um, you know, because God said, let us. So who's he talking to there? Let us. There's obviously more than one, right? He's saying, let us. And what a lot of people do is say, oh, well, he's talking to the angels, of course. Now, does the Bible anywhere say that we're made after the image of the angels? Nowhere. The Bible says that we're made after the image of God. Now, we do know that in 1 John 5, uh, 7, it says that for there are three that bear record in heaven, three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So we also see here God's creating everything, but we also see where it says Jesus created everything. Okay? And are we made in the likeness of God? Yes. Are we also going to be in the likeness of Jesus? Yes. We had this discussion tonight with us, uh, Jehovah's False Witnesses about, about the Trinity and how could there be three that are one? I don't understand. You know, that's what the Bible says. And this is all this is referring to in, in Genesis 1.26 when he says, let us make man in our, own, in our image. It's God. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost saying, let's make man in our own image. Because then, in verse, it goes from the plural in verse 26 
to verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. Verse 26 says, In our image. Verse 27 says, In his own image. From plural to singular, all within a verse. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So that right there from Genesis chapter 1 is teaching us this doctrine of the Trinity. Look at verse number 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God has given us as men dominion over all of the other creatures of the earth. He did not say, oh, you know, you need to, to crusade to save Mother Earth and to save these animals and to save this. Now look, I'm, I don't have a problem in general with conservatism in, in a sense of, of, you know, not wanting to, to make a species go extinct. But... We have dominion over them, and if, and if mankind wants to eliminate an entire group of animals, we can. We have that authority from God to do so. If it's going to provide value or benefit to humans, then I say let's use it because God has provided them for us, and we have dominion over them. I have dogs for a reason. They're for me, and I have dominion over them. And I'm going to treat them the way I want to. And I'm not saying I treat them bad, but I, you know, I'm going to do what I want because I have dominion over them. I have control over them. Now, um, God has ordained us to have that type of dominion. Let's finish up here real quick. Verse number 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see here in Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, they weren't meat eaters at first. He gave them the trees and the herbs to eat for meat, for food, for their sustenance, the fruit and everything else. That was their diet. And it wasn't until later, until sin, when blood had to be shed, where now things changed, okay? And then there's, you know, different dietary restrictions and everything else. I'm not going to go on and on about that, but there is something that, that I want to make a note of because when God made everything, it was very good. God's creation was very good. And if God created food, it's very good. And this is a very, very, very general resource that you can use in deciding what you should eat in your daily life. If God made it, it's very good. And that's a, a real simple concept to use. What I mean by that is when you go to the store and you want to buy some food for dinner, if you look at the ingredients and you see a list about that long, and it's not things like corn, rice, you know, um, carrots, potatoes, whatever. You know, if, if those aren't the ingredients, if it's like dye potassium phosphate and you know all these all different different chemicals you can't even pronounce, things that are obviously created in a laboratory, God didn't create those things. Okay. Now I'm not going to say every single one of those things, if you ingest them, are all going to be harmful to your body. But we know that the things that God created are very good. So if you want to eat healthy. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into this. This is a whole sermon topic in and of itself about our diet and what we should be eating and things like that. And there's lots of advice I could give you about that. But a very, very simple general rule of thumb that we could get from Genesis chapter 1 is that everything that God made is very good. So you want to eat fruits and vegetables and poultry and dairy and things that come directly from the source. And don't alter them and don't, don't get the stuff that's mixed with preservatives and with all of this other stuff because those tend to be poisons and those tend to be things that are not good for your body. And that's why we see all of the, the, the cancers and the Alzheimer's and all these other, these other diseases that we have today that didn't always exist. And there's so many interesting studies out there of, of peoples around the world. There's certain people that only eat like natural stuff and they don't eat processed food and they don't eat all this other stuff. And there's many, many diseases, many cancers that don't even exist. Like no cancer exists in those cultures. 
which should be an indicator that it's coming from what we're eating, from what, our, what we're ingesting, either, either what we're not getting or what we're introducing that's bad. It could be both. There's a lack of certain vitamins and nutrients and deficiencies that we're having that's causing us to, for our bodies not to respond appropriately against things like cancer. And we're introducing carcinogens that are going to help cause the cancer. And that's just one example. But if we were to just, just stick to what God made and what God has provided for us and try not to deviate from that, we would be a lot better off in general. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for your promises, for um, creation, for telling us how you did things, dear Lord, and that um, you basically spake the world into existence because every, every one of those verses where you created things, it's, um, it's you just saying, let there be light and, and let there be these different things, dear Lord, and we, and we thank you for this beautiful, magnificent world that you have created, dear Lord. It truly is uh, a work of art. And, and there's so many amazing things that we can learn from our surroundings and from the, an the creatures that you created and from the, the plants and animals. And it's so fascinating, dear Lord. And the more we study them and look into them, the more clear it is that you completely designed the way that they were supposed to work and that there is no way that these things could have gotten here by chance. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this wonderful world you've given us to inhabit and to have dominion over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.